Thank you for tuning in. We trust you will feel encouraged, uplifted, and inspired to build God's kingdom with us. Enjoy the message. Morning, everybody. Did you know that there are at least 130 different kinds of breads? Now, when you go to the shop, that must really make your mind and your head spin. Now, I come from a family where my dad owned a bakery, as I've said before. And uh, my dad baked cake and, and, and so on, and uh, breads and rusks and all this stuff. At night, we would bake bread. So the whole night, the bread would go through, and then in the morning, we start delivering. And some of the most bestest smells in my life was hot, hot, hot bread out of the oven. And my dad would bring it home because they would bake in the night. And he would bring it home for, to us, and we would have sometimes this hot bread for breakfast. And I, could, I can still hear that knife going through the crust as my mom would cut it. And it would fall open and the steam would come out of there. And then she would put butter on that hot, hot white bread. And then on top of that, she would layer it thick from time to time with apricot jam. Oh, some of you are going. You know, and when my mother did not look, I would take another slice when she would go somewhere else, and I would put thick butter on, and I would take brown sugar, but the sugar that, that, that is alive. You know what I'm talking about? That kind of sugar that when you put it, it moves like this. You know, it's like some of you, you know, you keep on moving, you know, when we look at that sugar, and I would put it thick on the bread, and then I would walk off to my room and eat it peacefully and quietly. Uh, before the mom comes back. You know, I remember my dad, I would work in the bakery, and my dad would, 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 you know, I don't know if he didn't believe, but he wouldn't give us pocket money. You know, that was like, you did it because you belonged to the family. But sometimes I would work a whole holiday in the bakery, and, and from early in the morning until late afternoon, carrying a, a milli meal on my back and all kinds of things, and, and so on. And then he would pay me with a pair of shoes, felis, felskuna. You know, but I remember that when I did that some, from time to time, and this was not good for my dad because he believed that if we would just eat from his bakery, we would eat his profits. So he always said no, no, but now and then we'd bring a milk tart or something at home as a special time. But I would go into the bakery and, and I would take one of those fresh loaves of bread, and Peter and I are going to do it sometime soon. And so I would cut them in half and give half to my friend, and then would eat the insides with whatever you want to do, and, and, and so on, dip it maybe in a sauce, but then put inside that crust, we would put slop chips. <sighs> and you would squeeze it in there and drink it in there. It's the best. Indian fellows is the big, biggest and the bestest bunny chow you can eat. It's slop chips in, and then drink it with a Fanta orange. Oh, man. <laughs> Heaven. Heaven. Okay. Now, let me tell you. So, as a baker's son, what's that? Yeah, the, no, it's not unhealthy. Look how good it looks, you know, and so on, you know. And uh, you know what? But as a baker's son, uh, I get totally confused when I go to a bakery these days because I think we had four or five different kinds of, now 138. That's confusing. That is really confusing. Any, anyway, you know what? Bread was the staple diet for most people for over 5,000 years. I don't think it's the same kind of bread that you and I get today. I think the bread was healthier in those days in many, many ways as well. But in the Mediterranean world of Jesus in that day, bread was, was probably the most important. It was the, a, a, a great diet. It was, uh, you, you would have bread and water and you would have a great meal. Maybe if you were a little bit more well off, you would have bread and some wine with it and you would have a fantastic meal. Or if you really want to eat out tonight, Night. You would have bread and some fish or maybe red meat or a slice of cheese and some dates on this bread. That would be seen in the Middle East in those days as a great meal. Now, bread was made out of wheat or barley. That's how they used to make bread. Now, Jesus comes and he says these words, I am the bread of life. If you look at 138 
different versions of bread, you may say, which one, Lord Jesus? But he knew exactly what he was saying. You see, Jesus would use these examples where he would address people with stuff that they knew, stuff that was applicable to them, their culture and so on. And he tells them, I am, now he's not saying I'm a freshly baked loaf from, from bread alone with sesame on the top. That's not what he was saying. He says, I am the only one, he was telling these people, that can nourish you along life's journey. That was what he was trying to tell them. Jesus is the bread of life. Will you turn with me to, Matthew, to John chapter 6? I'm going to read quite a few verses. John chapter 6, verse 22 to verse 51. Uh, we're going to read it together. Now, before we get to the passage where Jesus speaks about the bread of life, he says this in verse 22. He says, The next day the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there, and Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search for Jesus. Now, that, that's not a bad idea, to search for Jesus, all right? And then it goes on to my Bible, then gives a heading, Jesus, the bread of life. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I say unto you, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they ask him, what must we do to do the works that God requires. What must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered them with maybe an answer they didn't expect. And he said, instead of doing anything, it says here, he says, believe in the one that has been sent. So they asked him, what sign will you give them? Uh, What sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness as it written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and you still don't believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will not drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of the one who has sent me. And this is the one the will of the one who has sent me, that I shall lose none of all of those he has given me, but raise them up in the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. All of this the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourself, Jesus said. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. I will raise them up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. 
this bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Today we're beginning a series, and we want to preach seven sermons on the I am statements that Jesus made in the book of John. And seven of those statements, I'm touching on the first one today. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door or the gate to the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. I think what he's trying to tell us firstly with these seven sayings, I am. It was he is saying, God is present among you. God is present among you. And he's speaking to these people. And, and, and you've heard that statement before, have you not? In Exodus chapter 3 verse 14, it says, yeah, I am who I am. So Jesus is using the same kind of statement and and he's saying, I am the one that was spoken about in Exodus. I am all that you need. I am God among you. I am present. If you want bread, I am the bread of life. If you want life and find yourself out of darkness, you find me, the Lord Jesus. If you want your way to God, it is through me. I am the gate. If you want to be raised up to new life, it is me, Jesus. You will find eternal life. If you want care and protection, I I am your shepherd. If you want to know the presence of God in your life, I am the true vine. You see what Jesus is communicating here? Hey, that God of the Old Testament that says, I am, he is standing right here among you. I am the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Have you given it some much thought about what he means? What is he saying? I am the bread of life. To understand it, we've got to get a little bit here of the background to these verses. You know, in John chapter 6, Jesus begins and 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 he's got these 5,000 people sitting around him. And they are hungry at this stage. They haven't eaten all day. And he's preached at them all day. And he's taught them stuff. And then he calls his disciples and he says, hey, I'm going to feed them. And I'm sure that some of these disciples say, Lord, you know, this is an impossibility. He says, just bring me whatever you can find. And they found a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And he starts, he prays and he breaks them, and he breaks them, and 5,000 people are fed. What a miracle. What a miracle. And then it's nighttime, and Jesus' disciples get in a boat, and they go to the other side of the sea, but Jesus doesn't get in the boat. Everybody else, they have their bellies full, they go to sleep. And in the morning, they realize, hey, Jesus did not get in the boat, but now he's on the other side. And the mode of transport that Jesus used is only what Jesus could do. What did he do? He walked across the lake to the other side. And they get to the other side, and they find Jesus there. And you know what? Uh, John chapter 6, verse 24, and different translations will say it different. It says, they were seeking Jesus. What's wrong with that? I think that's quite amazing. I think it's awfully good to look for the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus didn't think that way because he knew what they were actually looking for. He, and so, so he tells them, he actually reprimands them when they find him. Come on up. What's wrong with seeking Jesus and finding him? You know what? Jesus knew that they were excited about maybe getting breakfast. Another meal out of him rather than looking for the bread of life, looking for he, him, himself. So he rebukes me and he says, man, you're looking for perishable things. It's not bad to ask for a meal. It is good to have, you, you know, you've got to feed yourself, you've got to eat and so on. But you are concerned with stuff that is not eternal. You, you love the fact that I can multiply bread. But that's not what this is all about. Jesus said to him, you will die in your folly. And in verse 20, 27, it says, do not work for that which perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. So Jesus is trying to, to he says, man, guys, you're looking for something that is too small, too temporal. Meaningless in a sense, although it is important from time to time. And last night I fed you and your bellies were full. And you're coming here for something to sustain you physically. But I'm offering you something that when you take what I'm giving you, you will never, ever hunger or thirst again. And they don't get the message. They don't get the message. 
Wouldn't it, how many of you are mothers and you're cooking meals regularly at home? And wouldn't it nice to cook a meal and you give it to your family today and they're not hungry again for two weeks? I mean, if I could perform a miracle, would you follow me like that? If I say, here is pre-packed meals in Jesus' name, and you just keep breaking Monday's meal, and by next week, Friday, it's still there. I mean, most mothers would say, that's the kind of preacher that I will follow. All right. So Jesus, you know, what is the, come on now, guys. Husbands and kids, what is the first thing the husband says when he gets home at night? You've had a full-time work, but he's got a full-time job. He comes home. What's the first thing he tells you? You can tell me. I won't tell him. I am hungry. Or what is for supper? Not how's it, babes? How was your day? First thing, what is for supper? You know what you should do, girls? You should write it on the door. Nothing. And he knocks on the door and the words nothing is on the door. And he opens the door and you say, the answer is already on the door. Nothing. You make it tonight. What is the first thing your kids say when they come after the sports game and they had a swim or a cricket match or whatever? And they break through those doors and they're tired and sweaty. Mom, what's for supper? They're always hungry. Husbands and kids are always hungry. That's why if I can do this, I will make money. If I can get you to produce a meal that would fill him for a lifetime or for a week at least, I th I'm sure that you'll come and shop. Now, Jesus is telling these people, and he says, you're looking for something temporal. Oh, yes, you need bread. You need food. That is good because it sustains you physically. So he has this conversation with these Jews, and he says, and, and the Jews said to him, you know what? God provided for us through Moses when we were in the desert, manna every day. And then on the, on the sixth day, we had to, to, to pick up manna for two days because on the Sabbath, we had a rest. And every day, we had our full. And it never went off. Yet, what we picked on Monday, we couldn't eat on Tuesday because it would be full of worms. It will be off. But he supplied our needs. That's what he did. Jesus looks at them and he says, you know, you're so amazed about that story. You're so amazed that that's what God to do. Let me tell you, the bread of heaven has come down to earth. I am he who stands among you. If you find this bread, and he points to himself, it will surpass any manna that will ever fall out of the sky. They don't get it. They just don't get it. And Jesus says, this is worth seeking, my friend. This food endures forever, for eternity. And he speaks about himself and he says, the bread of God who comes um, uh, down from heaven gives life to the world. In verse 33. In verse 35, he says, if you eat this bread, you will never hunger again. You will never thirst if you believe in me. And in verse 47 to 58, a few times he repeats it. And he says, whoever believes in me will have eternal life. If you eat of this bread I'm offering, you will never die. You will live forever. It's almost like he's beating on his chest and he says, I am the bread of life. What you're looking for is found in me, but you're looking in the wrong places. You're looking for temporal stuff. I am the bread of life. It is me that your soul needs, Jesus says. It is me that that, that that gap, that void in you needs. I am what your soul needs. You see, bread is very important, as I said, to the human uh, because it is fundamental to our daily lives. And, and we've changed the, the recipes a little bit, so it's not that healthy maybe, but there's still some really good healthy it, bread. It provides nourishment, sustenance, and vitality. It keeps you going. And then Jesus Jesus teaches us to pray this prayer, and he says, Father, give us today our daily bread. It is important. Give us today our daily bread. Except some of us are, are praying it like this, and we say, give me my daily bread while I do nothing. And that's not what the Bible teaches either. You see, you will get this physical bread. You need this physical bread. But this kind of physical bread comes through hard work. Are you with me? So God says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, my God will meet all your needs according to his riches in glory. But don't go and park there now and think, you know what, God's going to do it. I'm just sitting here and waiting. It, because I think that was the idea of the New Testament church in, in uh, uh, because in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's one thing to believe God will supply all my needs. But if you think God will supply all my needs and you do nothing, you've got it wrong. He says, we made this rule that no one who's unwilling to work will eat. I think there are a couple of people in the church that says, my God will meet 
my needs according to his riches in glory through Septi. Septi? No, it doesn't work like that. You see, there's a biblical principle that if you work hard, you will receive bread and you will eat. You will have your needs met. Jesus says you don't have to worry about your food or where you will, will sleep because I will do that for you. But what Jesus offers you is totally different. He says the bread I'm giving you, you cannot earn. You cannot work for. You cannot pay for. You can only receive it by faith. This is what these Jews that listened to Jesus didn't get. It says, what must we do? What must we do? And Jesus said, I'm the bread from heaven. Believe, just believe. Believe and receive it. You see, this bread is totally opposite to the bread that you and I work for. It is a gift from God based on your faith, and it is a lifestyle. Your soul needs this. My soul needs this. My soul craves for the bread of life, the bread of heaven. Otherwise, my hunger and my thirst will never be quenched. And anything else that I take on, material stuff, if I think that that is the bread that my soul needs, let me tell you that's junk food. That's junk food. So Jesus looks at these Jews and he says, hey, wait a minute, you're not getting it. So let, let me take you back to quickly to the Garden of Eden, all right? Here in the Garden of Eden, this happens, is, is Adam and Eve were there and God says, I command you, you shall not eat of the fruit. So the curse came in through eating, but the blessing also comes in through eating. Because Jesus, God says in the beginning, if you eat here, I'm telling you not to eat, you will die. And now Jesus says, if you eat me, you will live. Now Jesus is not encouraging us to, to be um, cannibalists and eat one another. That's not what we're saying. That's, that's wrong. I, I know that and so on. But he says, if you eat me, you will live. So life comes through eating. We know what it means. Because he says it, Twice in that chapter, he says, the work, this is the work of God in verse 9, that you believe in him who he, in whom he has sent. You believe in him. In verse 35, whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. So we're eating him by believing in him. There is a barrier, though, for most of us. What do you think the barrier is when it comes to feasting on Christ? I think the biggest barrier, not the only one maybe, but the biggest barrier is pride. Pride. You know, because coming to Christ, there's, there's a place where I've got to say, Lord, without you, I'm zip zero nothing. Without you, I'm empty. Without you, I'm lost. Without you, I am, I am absolutely, I'm, 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 I'm nothing. I'm absolutely going, going to a place where I don't want to be. It's only my pride that stops me from kneeling down and saying, I give up. I hand over. I hand over. And you know, we, we know friends like this and family like this, and we've begged and pleaded with them, and it looked like they moved towards God, and suddenly they stopped. And now their pride is in the way, and they just keep us at a distance because pride is a barrier. Because these people are saying, you know what, Jesus, we don't want anything for free. What must we do to be doing the works of God? What must we do? Now, it's probably not true of all of us. But if I had to give you something as a gift today, Amy, and I, and I say, Amy, I would like to give you, whatever, a handbag. What's the first question you will ask me? How much do I owe you? Because you don't want anything for free. Because it's in our nature, uh, for most of us, is we, when, when something comes for free, I want to I wanna do something. I want to pay back. Not all of us are like this, but most of us are like that, okay? And the Jews saying, what must we do? What kind of works must we do to do the work? And Jesus says, nothing. Believe. Nothing believes. So he tells them and he says, this bread of heaven is a free gift. You cannot earn it, but what must we do? You must do nothing. You must believe it by faith. And then a lifestyle change, yes, it happens. But how hard is it for us to put that pride aside, to just say, Lord, without the cross, I'm nothing. You know, I remember a song that we used to sing, a hymn, and it says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. And there's so much truth in this. So much truth in this. God, I have to come to you in humility and brokenness and say, this sinner needs Jesus. 
And he says, you know what? I am the bread of life. What does Isaiah say? Listen to Isaiah 51, verse 1. It says, come, anyone who is thirsty, come to the waters. Now listen to me. And he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Wouldn't that be nice? If I had to take you out for lunch today and say, you don't need money. I don't need money. We're just going to buy and eat. I mean, we're just going to eat. We're going to buy with no money. And Jesus says, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Jesus says, what I offer you is a gift. It is free. I am the bread of life. You cannot pay for it. But pride wells up. And, and, and again, they come a second time to Jesus. First they wanted to do something. And now they're saying, and li listen to how stupid this is. They're saying to Jesus, so Lord Jesus, uh, or sir, they said to him, what sign do you do that we may see and believe? What work do you perform? Get, get it in your mind. The day before, Jesus had all 5,000 people there, and he just broke bread, and he, and he did a miracle here with three loaves and two fishes, and, and, and he just broke it. And for 5,000, and vrachti, the next day they say, what sign will you do? Because our father, uh, Moses, gave us manna in the desert. Hey, if I was Jesus, I would have lost my cool with the people. I would have said, idiots, can you not remember yesterday? And, 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 and I take you back to the Old Testament where, where similar thing happened with the Israelites. Uh, remember Exodus? Here the guys go through the, that, that Red Sea, God parts it, and, and, and the, the Philistines or the Egyptians come, and, and suddenly the sea closes on them, and they say, yes! Two weeks later, a week later, they murmur against God. What sign? I've just done it. What more do you want? What other sign do you want? All right? You see, my dear friends, it's not a matter of lack of evidence that keeps someone from believing in Christ. It is a lack of a heart. It's a heart issue. It is a heart issue. They didn't want to believe. And sometimes when, when people come with arguments, I stop. And in my heart, I don't often say that to them, but I say, you don't want to believe. So you'll come up with every argument, whether I can prove to you, whether I can, whether I can make seven angels arrive here on green bicycles with trumpets in their mouths and, 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 and with banners all over them and say, God is alive. You don't want to believe. So that's not even going to convict you. Pride is standing in the way. You see, most, most religions today make you work your way to heaven. What must I do to be saved? Jesus says, believe your way. Believe it into heaven, all right? That's what it is. So he comes down and he says, my father gives you bread from heaven, free gift. It's come down from heaven. It's come down four, five, six times. It's come down from heaven. I am the living bread. Come down from heaven. I am the living bread. Come down, verse 51, 58. And then he says, again, every time he refers to himself, he says, I am, this is my grace. This is God's grace. Bread to you, free I am the bread of life. My friend, two more things this morning in closing. One of the things that I think is very concerning for me is that in my own life, I find myself sometimes do it as well. Is sometimes I seek the miracle and not the person that brings the miracle. And this is what these people, now, now give us a sign. Fill our bellies. Give us stuff, the Jews said to him. Fill our bellies. Oh, lunch was lacquer yesterday, but it's breakfast now. Come. Fill our belly. Give us another sign. So are you, are you looking for breakfast or are you looking for Jesus? Are you looking for money, wealth, prosperity, or are you looking for Jesus? What if I had to tell anybody today, there ain't no benefits in serving Christ, this side of the grave? Would you do it? Would you do it? If I said to you, only eternal life, but there's no health, there's no, he's not going to do nothing, that, there's nothing. There is no, there's only one line that says, believe and you'll be saved in the end. Would you do it? I think 80% of people say, nah, nah, there's nothing in it for me. There's nothing in it for me. You know, and Jesus is addressing, he says, man, beating his chest almost, I am, I will give you eternal life. It, I'm not talking about having your... Your stomach's full. And that's why in verse 26 he says, You are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate and you had your full. That's why you're seeking me. Because you're seeking me for the blessing. And he's angry with him. And he's angry with him. Now I ask you and me the same question. If God would draw any possible blessing 
would I still serve him? Would I? I am the bread of life. Jesus is making God present in our lives. I think it's time to get our priorities right. And we preach this kind of sermon over and over. Get our priorities right. Pressing in more actively into something that might be spiritually more attractive than rewarding us, the side of the grave. And I do believe there's a lot of rewards. Don't you get me wrong. I think God has blessed many of us out of our socks. And for us, blessing for you, Stuart and me, might be very different. But God has blessed us. But that's not why I serve him. That's not why you serve him. What if God reduces that or removes that from you completely? Will you still serve him is the question. What if, what if you had to go to bed tonight and Jesus appears to you in a dream and says to you, ask me anything you want, Andrew, absolute anything you want. What would you ask? Don't tell me. What would you ask? I think the majority of all ask for something physical. Something physical. When Jesus says, do you want me or the stuff? Do you want me or the stuff? And church, that's why some of us are like yo-yos in our spiritual walk. God gives, I'm high. God takes away, I'm low. God blesses, I'm hoo-ha. God reduces, I'm saying he's not fair. He's not playing the game. He's not nice. He's not what he says he is. What if God removes it all? Will you still serve him? Everything is a gift from God, and I thank God that he has blessed us. I thank God that some of you have a, a home to stay. Some of you have vehicles. We've all got clothes. We've all got some meals, some other time of the day. I thank God that some of you have, have been able to go overseas and, and enjoy a holiday at the beach or whatever your, that blessing is. And we have had our fair share of that as well. Fantastic. And God has blessed us with that as well, and for some reason, and so on. Material things is not the evil. It's when material things become the focus. And Jesus is a sideline. Listen one, once more. Listen once more. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you.